into the book of Philippians once again, but this time tracing uh, things that you could uh, relate to in your life. I think that that is important. Okay, uh, just to let you know, um, I came down with a really bad bug in in Myanmar about slightly more than a week back, and uh, I'm still on. <laughs> antibiotics right now. It was uh, quite severe. So I am on two sets of antibiotics at one time. So that, that becomes a bit... <coughs> so if you see me coughing and everything else, it's part of the bug uh, that is there. Uh, I probably am not uh, infectious at this stage, given the amount of thing. It's just that uh, after the posting is, is thing is over, the problems still remain, and uh, so it just a, a throat that is very easily irritated, and then the lungs are there. So after I speak for a while, we are going to uh, look at some of the challenges will be there. But then, you know, as we grow older, <coughs> uh, you begin to realize some of the reasons why I'm a bit more susceptible. It's also because of the injections I take to control the psoriasis and eczema. Uh, biologics work like that. They will target <coughs> whatever the problem is, uh, solve that problem, <laughs> but create another. So literally, my own immune system is actually uh, compromised because of it, because it depends on this particular drug to fight off. So it lowers resistance in natural immunity because I don't have a whole lot of that. So that's why I go to Myanmar and uh, the problem uh, is actually there and uh, it's not going to go away easily but it's something that I need to think about very, very carefully. So is this going to get me down? No. Is this something that I, I, that I want to uh, fight and overcome? Absolutely. Okay? So uh, well, let's begin in prayer together. Our Father, we thank you for teaching us that you are involved in our life. And we pray that you will teach us how to understand and appreciate the challenges which are there in life and how you can help us. <coughs> We pray for your grace and your mercies to be given to us. Help us to understand your work in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, let's turn to the book of Philippians and um, look at the contribution of the book of Philippians in our, in, in our whole understanding of our faith. Okay? So, basically, there are two main ideas. One, Paul traces the place of God in our life. Okay? Now, the other part of it is where Paul says, follow my example, which we will take up tomorrow night, and then uh, <clears throat> Tuesday, and then Wednesday, and then Thursday, and then try and complete it by in Sunday school on Sunday, so that we'll have a series of things that will go. So the question is, what is that all about? Right? So tonight, we're going to look into this subject of God involved in our life. And that <coughs> is a good question. How do we understand God in our life? Well, that, that's where the challenge is. Okay? So let's begin. Uh, the first part of it is... He who has begun a good work in you. Well, let's take a look at what this means, literally. Okay? Now, this is something that we need to uh, look at very, very carefully. Okay? So, this God is seen as initiator. Now, this is something that you need to look at. Sometimes we don't realize this. But without God being involved in our life, initiator, we don't really understand. We often think of our faith 
as something we believe in, something we do. And it's not. It's really much more complex than that. So let's talk about the grace and initiating work of God. Okay? Let's look at the book of the Gospel of John, for example. <clears throat> okay? So let's, let's take a look at this. And we see uh, the Lord Jesus um, talking to the people. And after he has fed the people, and you see this. This is the Lord Jesus teaching and the theology of it all. So there is a, a very, very wonderful example of, of the Lord Jesus and the Father. Okay? Now take a look at this. Look at the Father's role. Okay? Um, verse 31. The Father raises the dead. Okay? So this is very important for us to, um, <clears throat> as we take a look at it. And I, let's talk about the Father's work. Verse uh, 26, the Father has life in himself. Say, so don't marvel at this thing. Then he went on further. Verse 31, there is another who bears witness of me. This is actually a reference to God. Okay, and I know his witness is true. Okay, so then we read about greater witness. Then there's a witness of John. Okay, now this is important uh, where we, uh, we, we read. Verse 38, you do not have his word abiding in you. Okay, and then uh, he talks about these things here. And how can you believe? Okay, this is important for us to understand. How do we understand the Lord's role, God's work in our life? And it is absolutely important. This is chapter 5. Now let's take a look at chapter 6. Okay, um, <clears throat> Verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father send me, draws him. So 644. So 5 is the relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ with the Father. This is what the Lord does. He draws a person to himself. Now that is an interesting and important work. Right? You see, this is a work of God that very few... Uh, you, you want to pass the notes over to the back? Some people came late. Maybe the wise thing to do is to place some at the back. Right now, uh, our Indonesian friends, yeah. Uh, place some of the things at the back, not just the front, because we assume that people will come. <coughs> okay, so we're going to see this. <coughs> This happened, so it's just an irritation uh, that's there. Unfortunately, it's also flammy. Okay? Now, I, I just hope you understand what we mean by God initiates. Okay? So, Philippians 1, 2, for example, uh, where Paul says, grace and peace from God. Right? So, here we have grace and we have peace and it comes from God. John 6, 44, God draws. Now, you've got to catch this. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so you literally have to ask yourself what this means when we talk about God drawing a person to himself. And it's, it's difficult to understand this <coughs> because sometimes you wonder, how can this person... Is, gets drawn to God. How do people actually come to faith in the Lord? How does God, do, what is, what's actually happening? It's actually God working in the life of that person. Now that is something you need to know. So it's not, the, okay, I'm just coming to faith. I'm coming to church. That's your effort. It does not tell us that God is drawing you to himself. Thanks, uh, Chris. I've already got the other one. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's probably a bit hot, no? Not that hot. 
Yeah, so just, just in case. Uh, okay. Um, one of those things that um, you think about. Wood is uh, very sensitive to heat. And if it's anything that is, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> wow, we got a supply for everything. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so, so let, me, let me just uh, explain this to you. So when, when Paul says um, in Philippians 1, 6, he who has begun a good work in you, First, it starts. The God draws. God gives life. God gives grace. Right? God gives peace. Watch for these things in your life. You will never find this on your own. See, this is where we misunderstand. We think, I just think happy thoughts or peace. It doesn't come. God has to do this part of drawing a person to himself. If it doesn't happen, that is not God's work. You, you, you see what I'm trying to say? So I am really <coughs> forever thankful. What draws me to God year after year after year? God. How does He do this? Grace and peace and He sustains. So you can live year after year after year being close to God just like that. Because this is God's work in your life. This is what Paul noted. Not always in every life. Remember, there are people who will resist God. You see this in Paul's ministry. As he began to, uh, he went to different places. So there will be people who were resisting his work, but that's not from God. So you almost see an opposite effect. The evil one will create problems. That is what he's good at. And so this, we see this as God's work in us. So you've got to be able to trace. So how do you know you really are a believer? It's not, okay, I read Bible, I go to church. That does not tell me that God's working in you. You want to know where God's work in you? You watch this. He will draw you to Himself. He will begin a good work in you. How do you know it's God's work? He will finish it. That is how you know. And if it is not there, it's obvious that it is not there at all. I mean, this is something that you need to understand and need to appreciate. This is God's work. <clears throat> and uh, if, if we don't understand this, we can't even begin. So where does Christianity begin? With God. What is, where does it end? With God. What's in between? It's God. That is John 5. That's how Jesus looks at his life and his ministry. He says, the things that I do, God showed me. The things that I teach, God gave it to me. The life that I give, God gave it to me. The judgment that I make, God has appointed me. See, it's all about God. And if the moment we take God out of the equation, <clears throat> we use our wisdom, we use our understanding, we use our whatever, we really miss out on the place of God in our life. It's a wonderful work that God has begun. So, so there, are, there are few places where, where God, uh, Paul meant. In fact, the mention of God's work in Philippians is actually minimal. You want to see God's work, it's really the book of Acts. But it is really minimal when we think in terms of what God is doing. But all Paul needs to do is to look at how it works. And it becomes very obvious. Is this God's work or is it not God's work? It's, it's actually quite clear. Right? So when Jesus tried to explain to the people 
the work that he was doing, John, John 5, you know, it's all about God. And then he explained to John 6, so he just told them what God will do. He will draw them to the Lord Jesus. And if the person is not drawn to the Lord Jesus, you can be sure this is not a work of God. Now, I hope you understand this principle of whether it is God's work in you or is not. Right? Looking back at all the years of work, you know, how do you get sustained all the way through? And the answer is very well, it's God. It's really God. If you look at the life of David, he begins to realize it's all of God. Without, that's why he's sunk, he's dead long, many years ago. There are many wars that he has fought. How come he can escape? Well, this is important. It's God. So you have to watch out very carefully. He who has begun a good work in you. Now the question in Philippians 1.6 says, can you identify what is that good work? <clears throat> if we cannot identify even a good work, you can be very sure. It is not God's work. That's very obvious. Right? So, I mean, give, give you an example of, of what we think. What is that good work? In this case here, salvation. <clears throat> or service, whichever. Let's take a look at this idea, example of. Okay? Two things, principles of God. What He commences, He completes. <clears throat> This, you will see this in Jeremiah 31 to 33. Same. This principle is always there. So let us say that if we have true salvation, beginning, it will conclude. End. All the time. Let's say that we talk about service. He will commence and he will conclude. The same principle. So let us say that we think we are saved when you drop out. Question, is this real? <clears throat> Let's say we talk about service. We commence and then we drop out. Is this real? You see, once you see the Lord's work in your life, really, that it doesn't matter how many years may pass by. You know what? It will be there. Because it is God who commences and a God who concludes. This is a very basic understanding of our, of our faith, of, of God, in salvation, in service, in sanctification throughout. That's how you know whether a person is a real believer or not. So the question for us to ask ourselves is, what is that good work that God is doing in us? If there is nothing, then you're not a believer. It doesn't matter whether you're baptized or you're not. It doesn't matter whether you're a churchgoer or not. Because once you want to see God's work, it becomes very obvious. This is God's work. So this is a principle that we need to work with in Philippians 1 and verse 6, right? So in verse 6, we read this. Okay, this is absolutely important for us to <coughs> work on. So if you have questions you want to raise, I'll be happy uh, to take it up with you. Okay, so this is important for us to understand. Okay, being confident. Now the word be confident is uh, what we call the perfective tense. Okay? It's, the perfective tense is not really present in the English uh, grammar at all very much. Not in the way that we see anyway in, in the Greek text. The perfective tense works like that. Okay? So this is how does it work? A perfective tense. One, there is a work. Commence. So, I am confident, being confident. 
What is this confidence? Obviously, there is persuasion. I am persuaded that this is God's work. You know, I continue to be confident. That's what it is. So this idea of confidence is not the same as English, I'm self-confident. No. So let's take a look at the Philippian church, uh, Acts 16, for example. Okay? Now, you take a look and see this, God, this work of God. Let's, let's look at Acts 16 uh, so that you can catch a glimpse of, of it all. And you look, you analyze it very carefully. And you see, so, okay, so we, we see this. <coughs> the spirit called um, Paul, right? We read. They, um, the, the work of the Spirit of God is very, very, very obvious. Okay? So in chapter um, 15 and 16, we see this. Right? So the, the, in chapter 16, and uh, God gave to Paul a vision. <clears throat> uh, men of Macedonia called him to go over. Right? So that is where it commences, the call from God to go to Macedonia. Okay? Then we read, and they were staying in the city for some days. And they were, there was no synagogue, there was no church, there was nothing there. So he was there, and one lady among others came to faith in the Lord. Very humble beginning. Then Paul cast out a demon from a damsel, a young lady there, for which he was in prison. Then another significant conversion took place, the Philippian jailer. Then he was asked to leave. Now, what kind of work is that? <coughs> it's almost, if you analyze it, it is sporadic work. Here, stop. There, stop. Sporadic. Here, there, that's it. And yet, the Philippian church became so close to Paul. How come? How is that possible? Because by the time Paul wrote to the Philippians, this church had gone on further. See, this is God's, how you see God's work. God will commence that work. He will continue with that work. And he will not stop till he has concluded his work. That's how you know. Now, I hope you understand this. It's, it's so important. So whether it is in Bethel, God commencing the work, and for the 25 years he sustained the work, continued his hand of blessing, and he will conclude it. Whether it's here or it's in Bethany, 45 years and counting, same, commencing it, continuing with it, he will conclude it. That is our faith. We see God's hand in everything. Right? You know, this is absolutely amazing. So even if I am not there in Bethany proper, God's there. <laughs> So why go to India? What is happening? God is there in Bethany too. This is a work we believe in. God will always be there, even if we are not physically there. I, I hope you understand this. That the real challenge is to have this principle in our life. Can I see the good work that God has begun? Because if I can be persuaded, this is God's good work, confidence. Persuaded, literally it comes from the word persuaded, translated confidence. So I am persuaded that this is God's work. I continue in that persuasion, this is God's work. That's how you see. So the question is, has God begun that good work in your life? You see, when God does something, it's always good. When God does something, He will continue with it. And He will conclude it. See, the problem is, it is not God's work. That 
is the big problem. It's mere human work, and you know what? It will fail. So you look at the Philippian church. How did it become so strong and so close to Paul's heart? Right? It was the only church that supported uh, Paul in his work for a while, sometimes. Right? So, okay, so the, the Lydia came to faith in the Lord. Just one person. The Philippian jailer is another one. Two. And maybe along the way, some others. See, it doesn't matter how it commences. The point is, it is God who commenced it. And if God commands it, be sure He will continue and conclude it. The problem is, it is not God's work inside the life of the person. Then it is very obvious. So everywhere I go, I try and see, is this, because you can't tell on a human level, is this God's work? And you begin to see. If it is not God's work, that work will unravel. It will, it will disappear. There's no mistaking it. We don't see it from a human. This is quite a good man. He's very sincere. We don't care what he is. Question, is God working? Has he commenced that good work? So if God hasn't commenced that good work, it doesn't matter whether he's this, that, or the other. It won't turn out. You, you understand for me? So God can lay his hand on blessing. God can give grace and everything else. It still will not benefit from it because that is not actually God's work. Saul was not God's work. God will give him every possible advantage. He will still fail because that is not God's work. So Judas can be in the presence of the Lord Jesus, be appointed, be uh, set aside for ministry, and so on and so forth. But you know what? He will fail. Why? Because it's not God's work. Right from the beginning, the Lord Jesus already knew who would betray him. Does this to help us to understand the difference between God's work and not God's work in the same context? So on the outside, <clears throat> Judas is with all the other 11, learning the same lessons, eating the same food, in the same area, in the same ministry, in the same teaching, and yet this man will fail because it is not God's work. <clears throat> so the question is, what is God's work? How do you know it is God's work in your life? Philippians 1.6. Now, this is important for us to understand, right? So, he being confident of this thing here, Paul writes, right? He who has begun a work in, uh, in you, a good work. What is that work? He will complete it until the day of Christ. In other words, so we don't have to worry. Many people worry, you know, okay, I start this, can I finish it? I start this, can I sustain it? That's a useless and a needless worry. Because if this is God's work, I can be very sure it's going to be completed. It's not taking things for granted. It's not being presumptuous. It is just being confident. This is God's work. Right? How do you know a person is gifted of God? Same. Same. Same principle. God will commence it. He will continue to bless it. He will bring it to its climax. Same principle. So constantly you work with, is this work? How do you know it's a work that is really of God or not? One key word, it is a good work. That's, that's basically what it is. Same word as, I'm the good shepherd. Same word, good. How do you know it's good? It's obvious between good and bad. Very obvious. Is this good or is it bad? You can tell. Right? You watch. The character of the person will begin to show. That's how you can tell. 
No matter what you do, no matter how you hard you and you try very hard, let me do this. You know what? At the end of the day, it's the same problem. <clears throat> and that's what it is. Right? So we begin with the principle. So you've got to check. Is this is God really working in me or what? So I have to ask myself uh, over the years, how did I come to where I am? Okay, I, I, I look at my life and ask myself, <coughs> this is how I commence. Right? And I see the Lord's hand in all these things. Um, A, time. B, ministry. Uh, C, and, and, and growth, and so on and so forth. Because if I can see God's hand commencing, then I will see God's hand continuing, and I will see God's hand completing. See, that's the principle of seeing God's work in our life. But we start, and then you falter. Don't carry on, ask yourself here, go back here. See, many people try and solve the problem here. That is the problem. Right? Oh, what, what went wrong? If I were you, I won't start with what went wrong. I will go back to here. Then I begin to realize, actually, it's not God's work. It's my work. My feelings, my emotions, my thoughts, my desires, my will my action, my design, my plans, my hopes, my dreams. Keyword, my, yours. That's man's work. This is not. Now, this is interesting to see this. Right? And, uh, you know, there is a... I was talking to Pastor Chris about this man called Martin Lloyd-Jones. Now, his degrees are MBBS, MD, MRCP. He's, a, he's actually a specialist. In fact, he was appointed royal physician to the queen. Royal family physician. He was sharp in his diagnosis. And yet, he gave up everything to become a pastor. Did he go to seminary? No. Was he trained in other fields? No. He just read the Bible. And the Word of God came alive to him. It became real to him. That's it. And throughout his entire life at Westminster Chapel, he was able to sustain 40 over years of ministry. How was it possible? God's work. Rather than because he knew Greek and Hebrew. And Greek, no. It's just simply the Word of God coming alive to keep. That is God's work. Right? How do you know it's God's work? So I constantly look at it. So I, why, if God starts in me, you know what? I dare not look at, I want to carry on with my work. No point. If I want to start anything, I want to be sure, is this God's work? Because if it is God's work, He will sustain it. Sing. If I want to write poetry, write poems, and I ask myself, is it there or not? Is it? <coughs> I ask for that gift, specifically. Lord, if you really would like to give me this gift, you know, you, it's up to you. At the end of 40 years of ministry, I ask for that gift. Many people, at the end of 40 years, quit already. Time to retire. No, no, I have just begun Right? So now I can look back 40 years of ministry, many years of reading, I can now do this. So, commence, continue. How many have I written already? Over a thousand. You don't get to read all of them. You only get to read one, a few here and there. But that's it. I, I hope you understand this. You see, it's not just a writing for myself. What for I write for myself? 
See, that is a ministry. But remember this principle. God has to commence that work. How do you know God has commenced that work? It could be anything. Really, it could be anything. It is not necessarily church work. It could be almost any work that you know it is God's work. It is very obvious. And if it is not God's work, neither can you expect God to complete it. Right? So that's interesting. See, the, the Lord can work in the heart of one person, but not in another. And it could be the same family. See, that's the strange part of it. The Lord can work in the heart of the husband, but not in the wife. Or can work in the wife, but not the husband. Can work in one child, but not the next. How would you know? The one characteristic mark of God's work, it is a good work. The idea, in other words, is intrinsically good. That's what it means. Okay? You can comment on whether it's good or not later, but it is intrinsically a good work. Because God doesn't do a bad work. Never. If whenever God does something, it is always a good work, characterized by the word good. So if I start and I stop, is that good? No. If I start, I can't finish. What is that? That's why the Lord said, if you want, you know, it's like a person who wants to go to war with another a parable. Then, then you, oh, you know, I only got 10,000 troops, this I got 20,000. What am I doing? If I want to <coughs> stop something, can I be very sure I can finish it? What if I can't finish it? Then I've not counted the cost. That is foolishness. So you have to ask yourself, can we see? So this we are celebrating 25 years. Is this good? Is it God's work or not? That's one. So you could, how do you know it's God's work? It's a good work. And if it is not, the end is certain. But if it is good, God will continue to sustain it and one day complete it. Now, that is the first principle Paul worked with, being confident of this, that God, who, he who has begun a work in you, yeah, it always begins with God. He will draw people to himself. He will put that word of his in the heart. This is actually fulfilling what Jeremiah wrote about, Jeremiah 31, 32, 33. It's all there. Okay, so I, I hope you understand this first principle as we read Philippians. Philippians is where Paul is talking about that good work. That is important for us to understand. Okay, now the next part of it. Okay, now Philippians 2 and verse uh, 13, 12 and 13. Well, let's take a look at uh, Philippians again here. Now we go into the second chapter. Okay, this is very, very important. He says that, um, <clears throat> verse 12, okay, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your <coughs> salvation. Okay, this is very important. Work out your, your, your salvation with fear and trembling. How, do I, how does a person know he really, really has salvation or not? How do you know? Now, this is important for us to know, and that is an obvious thing. Chapter 2, okay, but well, let's take a look at uh, 12 and 13. Uh, I'm looking at another Bible because this is, we need the Greek text. Okay, let's take a look at this thing here. Okay, now this is where he calls them, beloved, just as in, in all that you've obeyed, now uh, in my absence even more. Okay, and this is absolutely with all, with fear, and with trembling, uh, work it out. Okay? One of the expressions of salvation is this word called obedience. This is Romans 1.4. Obedience to the faith. 
1 Samuel chapter 15, uh, God tells, Samuel tells Saul, has God greater delight than in obedience? Now that's a key word. So what is this obedience thing here? All right. In salvation, we are taught to obey God. Right from the start, Adam, Eve disobeyed God. That is a problem. And the disobedience is so much a part of us that we have a problem. You want to know whether there is salvation, you watch. There is obedience to God, His Word, His will, all the time. That if we constantly keep on disobeying, then it is compared to the sin of rebellion, the sin of iniquity, the sin of uh, idolatry. That is how weighty disobedience is as a problem. But you see, some people may obey only in the presence of. But the moment the person disappears, absence, go back to the old problem of disobedience. That's not how it works. See, true obedience is, is always there. Many years ago, there was a man called Pavlov, and he was uh, he's a psychologist. So he tested the dog, taught the dog how to eat only if the dog is told how to do it. <clears throat> So then you put food. Only if the signal is there, the dog will eat. The signal is there, not there, <coughs> will the dog eat. Okay, then uh, he one day uh, made a dog very hungry. Then he put food there. But there was no signal for the dog to eat. Question, will the dog eat? That is a big problem. Will you do it or not? Right? So the same thing here. Let's say uh, Singaporeans come to live in, in Perth. Here you have a freedom that Singapore doesn't have. I can do anything I want. <coughs> At least I think so. Okay? Here you can have drugs anytime. Here you can drink yourself stupid if you want to. You, you can drive much faster in some places, country roads. The question is, do you want to? Keyword, do you know what? I don't want to. Why? Because I'm trained to obey the Lord. So, what time do I get up here? Uh, same time, morning. What time do I sleep at night? Same time. What do I do uh, in the free moments that I have? Free moments. I read two books already. Right? Now, do I want to do that? I keep up with my discipline all the time. See, this is obedience. Not circumstances, just simply obedience. Now, so I work out my salvation. How do I know my, my salvation will work itself out? Okay, A, fear. B, trembling. So, do I, not that I fear that I am not saved. That is natural. So, I tell myself, if I really, really am saved, I'm going to do this. Right? This is absolutely important. Now, it is not easy a thing to do, but it's natural. This is the second part of it, right? So, I, the first way to check whether God is working in me is with reference to salvation. Not in terms of ministry, but in terms of salvation. Can, can you see the relationship 1, 6 to 2, 12, and 13? What is their good work? It's actually salvation. So what? So I used to be disobedient before. Now, if I'm saved, I've got to be. I cannot be the same. I've got to be obedient. 
See, if I'm still disobedient, am I safe? You can't justify disobedience anyway. Saul tried, you know, because the people, because the people, because you were not here in time. That's why I did it. You can blame anybody you want. Right? But if I really, really understand myself properly, God's good work in me, I will be very careful to look at my life and I live it with fear and with trembling. Okay? Because I am uh, on two end sets of antibiotics at one time. So the doctor has already told me, you must make sure you don't eat on an empty stomach. If this thing here, it will make you feel terrible. So like it or not, <coughs> I will have to have something in the morning before I... So I'm used to just having fruits. This time, not good enough. I have to have something else. Right? Now, I have to walk it out. Now, he's not there to check. How do I do it? Fear and trembling. In other words, how I work it out, I will show, am I doing this work out of the sense of reverence or not? Am I doing this because I really feel the way I should do it? See, the problem is a lot of people, people think, but they don't have fear and trembling. And that is a problem. Right? You know what's fear and trembling? You see, one day when uh, Saul was very tired in the cave, and David was in the same cave, and he cut off a piece of clothing from Saul. And, and David really felt bad about it. For one simple piece, he didn't kill Saul, but he said he really felt bad about it. Now, that's what we're seeing, fear and trembling. So how do I know I really am saved? I will stand in awe of God, fear and trembling of my salvation, and it will work itself out. Now, here's the first, this is verse 12. Now, verse 13 is very closely connected. So I work it out, right? My salvation expresses itself. How? Here is my will, and this is what I do. It's easy to talk. Let's not talk. Let's really do it. That is the problem. Right? It could be anything. It really, really could be anything. How do I understand it? Now, among my church young people, they, say they have a, you know, it's something that they do among themselves. Now, not everybody does it. But on the first, after the first month, after they receive the first salary, it's actually quite common for many of the young people to take the first salary and give it back to God. Now, that's unusual for many people. Most people, for well, first salary, okay, let's, I treat you, I give you a treat, let's go and do this, let's buy some nice new clothes, this is my first pay. Instead of doing that, let me do this instead. <coughs> One day, a lady came up to me and said, Pastor, I want to uh, give you, uh, give to the Lord's work, a uh, gift. So I said, uh, what, what is it for? He says, well, actually it's my birthday. And uh, my husband told me I can go to Tiffany or Cartier and pick anything I like. Anything. 50,000 as a birthday gift. And she said, you know, I don't need anything. And I don't want to have this. 
So I'm going to give the entire check to the Lord instead. To will and to do. If you can, somebody will give you a $50,000 necklace. Would you take it? Ladies, that sounds nice. Right? She said no. Why? My will. I don't want it. I don't need it. There we go. Or I can have a ring, $50,000. I don't want it either. Is it possible? Yes. Both to will and to do. You see, that's how God works in us. First, He works in our will. <clears throat> then He enables us to fulfill what we will to do. Now, that is not easy. <coughs> okay? So I, I, I told the church I was coming to Bethel and I was coughing along the way. And I know a lot of people, they look at me because they're not going to say anything. <laughs> so I told them, don't worry about it. See, it's my will. God working on my will. It's still your will, by the way. Right? But it will be God's work on your will. What do you will? And what would you do? Well, will and do. So I, I know that I have, don't have a whole lot of time to do what I like to do. So I make it a point. I must continue to read no matter what. Right? God will help me with my will and to do. Oh, I don't like to, oh, I got no time, I am too tired, I got so many things to do. Of course you have. God will help me with my will. That is God's work. So He commences that work, draws me to Himself, salvation. What is He going to do next? He will do the next part. He will work on my will. He will not work on your want. <laughs> because you're very good at that already. You don't need help from God to do the wounds. But this is what God will do, the will. How about that? You know, it's, it's good. You know, as, as you begin this week, as you begin each day, how about this? Can I do God's will? And I want to be asked myself, can I do it? Then I'm not... <coughs> going to rely on my confidence and so and so. I'm just going to say, this is God's will. Let me do it. How do I know? It's always with fear and trembling. But when the mouth is always speaking bad things, sharing bad thoughts, I don't like this person, I don't like the way he does these things and all that, you can be very sure that is not God working in the life of the person. That's very obvious. And until we deal with the sin that is there, we will never make any progress in our spiritual life. We'd like to think we are. We're not going to. Come. Unfortunately. Okay? Think about this thing here. Right? So these are challenges that we need to uh, consider. All right, here's a third part. <coughs> that we want to take a look at. And this is Philippians 4.19. Now that is an interesting thing to take note of. Okay? And so Paul said to the Philippians, he was telling them, um, he was just sending a words of appreciation. Uh, thank you for uh, the gift that they supplied and gave to him. Philippians 4.19. Take a look. Before we look at 4.19, let's take a look and you'll see this very clearly. Chapter 4, right? And uh, we see this. I rejoice in the Lord greatly. At last your care for me has flourished again. Though you did care, you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in uh, regard to need. I've learned whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. 
everywhere and in all things. Learn to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you've done well in that you shed in my distress. You Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me. So after Paul went away from the Philippi, after he was asked to go, no church supported him. <clears throat> Partly because they don't know where Paul was in Syria, Antioch, Syria. They, no, no email in those days. No tele, telephone, no telegraph, nothing. So they wouldn't know. Right? But some of the work there, uh, a lot of problems, difficulty. So Paul said, but you did. Right? So uh, concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once again for my necessities. Not that I speak in, uh, I, I seek a gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full. Right, so Philippi was actually a very young church then. Right? So it's young and it is not very experienced. And yet they knew enough we are going to support Paul. Is he going to Thessalonica? We will send support there too. So this became a church that kept on supporting and giving to Paul. This is called fruit. Right? And this is wonderful. We, church must never be afraid to give. This is absolutely important because the moment we think about, I, I shouldn't give so much, otherwise we don't have enough and all that, you've got a problem already. Then this has been our absolute uh, experience over the years. We gave to Bethel when we were having our own building project. <clears throat> right? So there were two projects at the same time. It was huge. One was a $12 million project. Did we have the money? No. But we had the faith. And here was another two and a half billion. Okay, there we go. At the same time. So it was completed. Same thing, we just completed another 10 million project just last year, nearly two years ago now. Right? Because we had the money? No. But we had that faith and that love and that good work that God has begun. What's the principle here? He says, my God shall supply all your need. The word here, supply, is literally the idea of giving you full supply. It's a fullness of the idea. God will completely, fully give to you all your needs in life. And this is so important. You see, sometimes we don't realize how we begin. And it's so good to be able to trace God's hand in our life. And I think that we all uh, need to think, take time to think about it. Okay, let's see if you don't mind. Uh, Uncle S.T., what did you start off with? You see, Trump started off, he said he earned it all. Actually, not true. Because by the time he was eight years old, he was already a millionaire, all the father's money. So he had hundreds of millions before he even started anything. So, so the, all the extras uh, came about, but the starting, the nest egg was there. But some of us, Uncle S.T., did you start off with a big fat account? No, as I say, right? So we asked Uncle Lai, did you start off with a big amount? No. I started life with a suitcase. Well, two suitcases. One my wife, one mine. <laughs> that was it. Right? And you know what? This principle is true. First, he who has begun a good work will complete it. Two, Right? He will work within us our will and our action, what we do. 
And the third thing here, God will <coughs> supply all our needs. Not just barely enough. According to His riches in glory. So we look at the things that, the riches in glory part of it, and we begin to realize, actually it's true. God has fulfilled and kept His word. Right? One day there was a rich man, and he was telling the wife, I'm going to take a lot of money, and I'm going to bring two suitcases. Please be sure they are filled with gold ingots. Right? So I, we are in the upstairs apartment. So we have no apartment, but a house. We've got a three-story house up there, down below, and a basement. They, don't forget, I will take this with me. People tell me I cannot, but I will take it with me when I die. And when, and, and when he died, the suitcases were still there. So he couldn't. The wife was thinking, maybe I should have left it in the basement. Oh. Maybe he can take it with him there. You see, that's our problem. We don't know that God will supply all our need. And so we worry about this, worry about that. See, the problem is we are all so fascinated with numbers. How many, how many numbers after the... Ding, 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 ding. And the more, the, the happier we are. Actually, not true. How much can you eat at one time? Yeah. That is, that's how it works. What is it? So we like to think of numbers, you know. The bigger the number, the, that's what it is. And, and we've forgotten uh, how children can be very happy with a little toy. They don't know, they don't have much in the bank, neither are they worrying about it. They're just happy with a little toy. See, we, we created this system for ourselves. And we're not happy unless every year we add another zero behind. Another year we must add another zero. And if we don't add another zero, we I don't know, why, what happened? And we'll just kill ourselves trying to be happy with numbers. And that is sort of unfortunate. How does it work? Paul's principle is I have learned a base abound. It really does. Have. Whatever state, God is there to supply or not supply. Right? God is able to supply or not, depending upon whatever it is. It really doesn't matter. To me, that is a wonderful three-point thing here about God. Has He commenced a good work in you? Are you seeing Him completing it? Is He working in you? Because if He's working in you, it will, be, it will have to do with your will and your action. That's how you know. And when it comes to financial matters, I think this is the biggest problem of all. Because we don't know how to see God's hand in financial matters. We always have to worry about now <coughs> what happens if I grow old, what happens. Unfortunately. Right? So this is something that we all uh, need to, to think about very, very carefully. If only we can understand. The big chief who developed Apple into what it is, that is before he died. And after he died, he towards the end, to the Lord, he says, if only I realize that all I need is a bed. That's all I need in life. I wouldn't have spent all my time developing it into a company that very, very frankly, is the world's richest company, and barring bar none. And what do we have at the end of it all? Nothing much. Just a name, just a reputation, you're dead. Anyway. Right? God is what we're looking at. If only we can realize that God will supply all our needs instead of just flogging ourselves, pushing ourselves, you know, telling ourselves we must have this, we must have that, we must we ought to have this, we must have that. You kill yourself overdoing all this. For what? Mm. Really? 
that we don't even know how to part with. I had a, a fairly young friend many years ago, and uh, he came. You know, sometimes it's just the Lord's work. So he came from a very wealthy family. And so he said, you know, Pastor, I, I'm thinking of going to Japan. Uh, after I finished university, I told my parents. They were upset with me, but they said, okay, you do whatever you like. Uh, so he went to Japan to become a missionary. Said, Are you sure you're ready for this work? In Japan, that's a tough country. <coughs> and in two years, he became depressed. So I saw him when he was coming back, he was back to take leave from his work. He was going to quit his work. And he felt bad too. On the one hand, he felt God had called him. But on the other hand, he felt that he had led no one to Christ and the work was so hard, he was really depressed. So I told him, I gave him this word and I said, you know, maybe the Lord's work is really not your calling. He thought, he says, you think about what you can do instead. Now, his father owns hotels. So he started off, went off, became a manager there. You know, three years later, he became the general manager. It helps when your father owns a hotel. So he was a very young GM. Then he flew back to Singapore and he says, I just want to say thank you. This is my calling, right? Since then, he's, uh, since then, he got married, no children yet, but he says, you know, every day I minister and I talk to my staff and I do work and I'm doing it happily. And you know what? I'm not depressed anymore, so I'm good for you. You see, what God has begun, if that is the work of God, it will continue it will be completed. It is not true that everybody is called to the Lord's work. You like to think that you are. But if you are, all the gifts will be there too. All the strength, the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding will also be there. If it's not there, you can be sure this is not God's work. It's not for you. So he said, I told him, don't feel bad about it. You know, the world still needs hotels. Just make sure that you do a good and honest job of doing it. Don't, don't underpay your, your workers and, and everything else. He said, no, nope. I'm going to run it as I would as a Christian. I said, good, do that. Be a good GM. Right? The father owns many hotels. He's just managing one of them. That's good. Carry on. What's wrong with that? To become a hotelier, nothing wrong. That's what we are looking at. Okay? So whatever gift it may be, that is something that is absolutely amazing. And God's work could be anything. We had, uh, last weekend, we had a man, his name is called Pratit, uh, from, uh, in, uh, in Thailand. You see, uh, Thailand is a country where it is not Bangkok, not Hajai, not Phuket, Basically, if you live in the countryside anywhere, you most likely have a village that is unpronounceable by other people. And frankly, nobody knows and nobody cares. And he was like that. So if he wants to have dinner and fish, he goes to the river, puts his net, take the fish, okay, that's his dinner. That's, that's all they have. Nothing very much. You know, you, he's a musician, by the way. Where do you think he started learning about music? 14 years old. When he went and joined a school band. That's it. So he's, he's never seen a piano before. Until What are the chances of a child learning music at 14 years old? So he studied and uh, he joined the army because he told his parents kind of fought to send him to the university. Joined the army so that he can get a free education. So he went to study there, and all he had was a diploma. That was it. So somebody went over, or sent over by Thai government, 
to go and study at this very prestigious UK university. And he couldn't stand it after one semester. And he was asked to replace him. So he went there. He went down there and he taught his university in music. Now, he's only got a few years of music background. Right? They went on to do his master's. Now, he came back to serve in the army for a while. And uh, he's an army officer. He's a full colonel. Last month, he was, tell he was telling me, he says, Pastor, last month I obtained my doctor of music. Wow. He said, my score was 4.0. In other words, a summa cum laude. He topped his class in everything he did. I thought it was pretty amazing that he could actually do that. He says, Pastor, I will tell you, God did not give me an education for myself. He gave me an education so that I can tell people about God in music. He is presently the principal conductor of the Thai Philharmonic Orchestra. He has conducted the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra as well. So he is actually a very well-known conductor in his own right. And so they ask him to set up a thing here. He says, but all our instruments are also outdated. How can we have a credible uh, uh, thing here? Now, many people don't realize this. <clears throat> In Thailand, there is the king. There is the prime minister. Right? The politician, he's elected here and there. Do you know there's somebody else who is next to the king and actually in power even more important than the prime minister? Do you know him? His name is General Prim. This is the one who can order the army kick Thaksin out and he's gone. This is the general. Now, oh, that's pretty amazing. So, Prakti was saying, Pastor, God supplied all my needs. Because when I wanted to go and study music, I had no money. The army paid for my scholarship. So, when I wanted to study a doctorate degree, which is, army doesn't give it. Because only the first degree. You know, it was General Prem who said this. Now, General Prem, I saw the photograph of him. And he can sit on the chair. His four-star general sit at his feet. Chief of Navy, Chief of Army, Chief of Officer sit on the floor at his feet. He sits on the chair. If the king needs to make a decision, he will not call the prime minister. General Prem, what do you think? And so he told me, Pastor, God brought General Prem into my life. He brought the king, old one, a new one, plus the queen into my life. So when I have a concert, my the royal majesties attend everyone. So he said, Pastor, uh, how, I said, how close? I said, yeah, this is the king. I'm here. I can walk into the palace any day I feel like walking in. They recognize him as the adopted son of General Prem. So he said to me, Pastor, what do you think are the possibilities of me becoming where I am? And I'll tell you the answer. Zero. It was God's work. 
And so he met about 60 of our church musicians. Yeah, we got about 60 of them. And so they are preparing for a Christmas caroling with uh, almost a full orchestra. Uh, so it's going to be a very special thing. He says, I've already practiced with them, run through <coughs> with them. You know, you can do it. He writes the music score for every piece. So there's a violin piece, there's a trumpet piece, there is oboe piece, there's a French horn piece, there's even a guitar piece, and the drum set piece, and the keyboard is. Everyone has to be, it's not the same type of music. He's got to write everyone differently, so they all blend. Such knowledge is beyond me. He said, well, Pastor, I can hear every piece individually. Huh? Are you serious? He said, yeah. I can hear every piece differently, and I know how they blend. That's amazing. He said, Pastor, I will tell you, this is my testimony. This is my story. Right? It is God who began. It is God who continues. It is God who works on my will. He says, I will tell you something. How do I see God in my life? Every time I read the Bible, God is speaking to me. So when I write music, I will look at it. He says, this is not Pratip's work. This is God's work in Pratip. He took one of our songs, Is Anything Too Hard for the Lord? And he turned it into an orchestral piece. And it's absolutely amazing. That is how God worked in our life. Fear and trembling. He is totally continued to be unspoiled by all the success he's had. <clears throat> so that was important. You see, so he's one of those corrupted, uh, uh, non-corrupted, incorruptible uh, army colonels. I don't want that. I don't want anything that is going to affect God's work in my life. I would go anywhere and serve anywhere. I said, look, you just open the door here. Chances are you're going to come back to Bethany again. For, he says, Pastor, I, my greatest joy is to write church music. That you have no idea how much Bethany inspires me. That is his testimony. And that is amazing. Then I want to share this with you. I really, really do. So as we look at Philippians, God's work, look at 1, 6, 2, 12, and 13, 4, 19. And once you can see God's hand in your life in this way, and you begin to realize this is obviously God's work in your life. Or in the church work. It's obvious. He will give the skill set. He will give the grace. He will give the blessing. He will open up doors. He will enable you <coughs> to do things that you don't think is possible. But it's there, very obviously. So I, I really want to challenge you and encourage you. Look at what God is doing in your life. Not your effort. Not your ideas. Just God in your life. It should be very obvious. Think about this, okay? Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we just want to thank you for the joy that is in our heart. The joy of you giving to us salvation, of your work commencing, your work continuing, and one day your work completing. Lord, help us to see your hand every step of the way. And help us to desire to see your hand changing our lives bit by bit, but definitely. We pray that you will help us to see the good work you are doing rather than what we are doing. Lord, give to us that wisdom to understand all these things. That we pray that you would help us to see changes in our lives that must take place if this salvation is true at all. We pray for your grace and your mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> okay, thank you.
and uh, we'll see you tomorrow night. <clears throat>